Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel and in today's video we'll be looking at the all important camera settings in Dash Studio and as a bonus we'll be looking at those very cool bokeh effects in Dash Studio. So let's get to it. Right so here we are in Dash Studio, I've got my HDRI map here in the background, I've got my figure and yes it's not a female figure, I do use male figures as well just to let you know. Uh, and we're looking at those all, all important uh, camera settings, so camera here, parameters, got my camera selected, go to parameters, there's my camera. So let's have a look at all these settings. So the X translate, we all know it moves the camera on the left, on the, on the X axis, left and right. So obviously my HDRI map is not going to move, my figure is going to move because we're using the infinite sphere uh, for the HDRI map. So I'm just going to set that back to normal. Uh, y translate will obviously move it up and down, so positive number up, negative number down. Z translate, you know, move it back and forward, so obviously my character is going to go smaller and bigger. And then we've got X rotate, which will rotate it on the X axis, so we're going up and down on the X axis. Just set that back to normal. And we're going to do Y rotate, which does the same thing, which will rotate on the actual, rotate on the actual X axis, but using Y rotation. Put that back to normal and Z rotate. Now Z rotate is really really cool because you can get this like very unusual, very unsettling kind of um, image, and it creates this image actually creates a lot of tension. So if someone's on Instagram or you post your uh, image on a, a website, a forum, or whatever, uh, people will definitely look twice at this still because it's very unsettling and very unnerving. So the more you kind of use the Z rotate, so if I went a bit crazy and said, you know, something like that, that's quite unsettling and nerving, and that makes you, that will make the person want to look at your image even more. So consider using Z rotate as well uh, in your in your uh, in your renders. So I'll set that back to normal. There we go. So scale, scale. I'll show you what scale is. So if I actually go to my perspective view, if you watch the camera here, I don't think scale does anything. So scale, there you go. It actually makes the camera physically bigger. Now, if I go back to my camera, nothing's actually happened. So nothing's actually, the, the, the scale of the image or anything hasn't gone up. So it's basically the same. All it's done is actually made the camera bigger. So I don't know whether that's a bug or whether that's something unusual, but the scale actually doesn't do anything. So we can actually set that back to normal. However, when we use the X scale, the Y scale and the Z scale, magical things start to happen. So basically if I use the X one, you'll see that it kind of gets all squishified, starts to kind of squeeze the uh, image. So if I go back to my perspective view, you probably can't see it from that angle. But if I go the other way, uh, you can't actually see from that angle. Okay, not a problem. So if I go back to, if I leave my perspective view actually, if we do the Y scale, if you watch the uh, camera here, it's actually going to uh, increase in uh, Y, in uh, on the Y axis, so there you go. It's actually increasing. And when we go to back to our camera one, you'll see that it's starting to, do, to change as well. So if you see, look, the image is starting to get squished there, or get bigger, depending on whether you do, whether you go higher or lower. So the same thing with the Z. You start zooming in and you start zooming out. So that's something you may want to look into. I've never looked into it, but you never know. If you want to do something crazy with the images, why not? Maybe like if you're doing some sort of a, uh, a dream a dream state kind of image and you know when you have dreams, dreams are, are unusual. So maybe that's something you consider something's dream, dreamlike maybe. So a great effect for that. Right, and our next setting is point at. So what basically this does, the camera, you can tell the camera specifically where to point at something. So if I said to my camera, right, this guy here, Trajan, if I told him to point at his, I don't know, his, his eyelashes, except it's going to point at his eyelashes. Now you're probably thinking, why isn't he pointing at his eyelashes? The reason is because it actually works here from the top angle here. So if I just show this here, this is the actual, this here is not the actual way. So when, it, when you do point at, this is not what it will point at. This is the camera. The actual point is here. That's where it figures it out from. So this is the actual point. So this top bit here is actually pointing at his, eye, his uh, eyelashes. So when you choose this, you have to be very careful as to what you're choosing. So even though I said point at eyelashes, the camera saying, well, yeah, I am pointing at eyelashes because look, 
I'm, I'm actually pointing at it, but physically is actually pointing down here where we're looking at his feet. So uh, there's something you need to look at. You can use this. Um, it's a very good uh, idea to use this. Say if you wanted um, to point the camera directly at uh, the eyes of uh, your figure, that you can do that. So just just remember that obviously when you choose this and you think, oh, why isn't it working? Well, that's the reason why, because that's the actual point where Daz figures out that's the camera. Right, so let's go back to uh, my camera one. And I wanna actually turn this off now, so I wanna just reset this. Uh, not reset it, I wanna just point it at none. Except, there we go. Uh, now let's, let's look at the display settings, so display. So visible, let's go back to perspective view. Visible just means whether the actual uh, camera is visible or not. So if I turn it off, it will disappear from there, from there, even though it's actually still in the scene. So if I go back to camera, it's still there. It's just not actually showing up to the scene. Um, I suppose the reason why you would use this is if you've got too many cameras in your scene or there's just so much happening that you can't, you don't, you want to see the scene correctly. You don't want to actually um, have the camera in the way. So that's probably one reason why you would want to use this. So visible in viewport. So if I turn that off, the same thing happens there. It just gets rid of it from the viewport. It will just say it's not there. So turn that back on. Selectable in viewport. So if I turn it off and then I try to select it, it won't let me select it basically. But if I go turn it back on, if I say clicked off it and then I clicked on it here, it'll select it. There you go. See in the scene tab. So if I do that again, I'm not selected it there. I'm going to click on my camera in the viewport and now it's automatically selected it. So that's what selectable in viewport does. Now display persistence is the actual um, wireframe here, the wireframe, the DOF and the, uh, the FOV and the DOF settings here, these here, this is what this is. So if I turn that to off and then click off my camera, the actual settings go away. However, if I turn it back on and then click off my camera, the settings are still there. The wireframe will still be there. That's what that setting is. So I'll go back to my camera. Now sight line is this here. This is your sight line here. So it's opacity. So at the moment it's always on 30%. So if I increase that, it'll just get a lot more visible. So there's your sight line there, blue line. A lot more visible now because it's at 100%. Focal point scale is this here, this green line here. This crosshair, you, you, you can't see. It's just here, the green and the red. So if I make this bigger, increase the size there. As you can see, the, the size has increased. So that will make it more visible if you're working from, say, far away, like this angle that I'm working now. So FOV color, quite straightforward. It just changes the color. So if I wanted, I don't know, red. That's my FOV here. This is it, field of view. FOV means field of view. So that's my field of view here now. And the opacity, I can set that up. So if I increase it, it'll be like, obviously very, very red. There we go, very, very red. So FOV length, we could change the length. So if we increase it, we can decrease it. Okay, so that's just actually increase the, increase the field of view. It hasn't actually physically increase the field of view. So to physically increase the field of view to, to move this, you'll have to move this crosshair here, you would have to move the, uh, the focal distance here, uh, which we'll get to in a bit. So the depth of field plane visibility tools here, all these I'll come back to in a bit. We'll just go straight into the camera here. So this one here, perspective view. So if I go back to my camera, actually, you'll see a bit better. So at the moment we're in perspective view. What you can do is you can turn off perspective view and then this will end up being the orthographic view. So if I click that off, you'll see things will start changing. There we go. All right. So what this, this means now, this is actually on the orthographic camera view. So you wouldn't really use orthographic view is the reason why you would use it rather orthographic view is because you were working on say buildings or something where things have to be very specific. So things such as buildings, they, they need to line up correctly. Obviously you don't want to have like a wonky building because that's not going to work. So that's the reason why you would use that. Um, next one is the frame width. So we can uh, increase the frame width and decrease it. So there we go. It's almost like a zoom in, zoom out feature. So you basically want more in that frame. 
So this is the focal length. Uh, this is basically kind of zooming in, zooming out um, of our lens. So anything less than 35 is normally considered like a wide lens, so like a wide shot. Anything about around about 50 is your standard lens. And then anything more than 85 is your telephoto lens, I think it's called. Yeah, telephoto lens. So that's basically kind of like you zoomed in kind of shot there. So you can play around with those figures there as well. Um, depth of field, I'll turn that on. So depth of field basically gives you that lovely blurring effect at the at the back. Uh, don't worry about this. Gives you that lovely kind of blurring effect. So depth of field you would use to focus on an object. So you would use that to put the focus on that object. So you would blur out the background, have the focus on the foreground, or you'd probably blur out the foreground, some of the foreground, and have the focus on the background. So that's what depth of field is. So coming back to focal distance, if I go back to my perspective here. So this is my depth of field here, this here. These are these white these white boxes here. This is the near one and this is the far one. So my focal distance remember is this here. Is this uh, sight line here? So when I oops, when I uh, increase it, you'll see it increase. So that's why that does the focal distance. So we're moving the actual focal distance here, this here. Okay, uh, next is the f-stop. So f-stop is kind of like how much of the blurriness you want to have. So a lower number would make your image very blurry and a higher number will make it less blurry. So if I went to something like 10, if you watch this white box here and this white box here, you'll see all the, you'll see that they'll decrease, and they'll decrease, they'll get close together. 10, wasn't it? There we go, 10. So there you go. So we've increased the f-stop which is kind of like the blurriness. So if I go back to my display settings and I go back to my uh, DOF uh, plane visibility, you'll see if I turn it off, it'll just disappear. This set here. So that will turn off. Actually, one there on. The color as well, we can change the color. So I don't know, we can choose green. There is green. So, that's, so, so now I know that that's my field of view. That's my depth of view, uh, depth of field. So you've done that. Now visible in render and simulation, these two actually don't do anything because we're in IRA mode, um, it doesn't have any effect. So these uh, these will always be visible um, as in terms of the, the depth of field will always be visible because you turned it on in the camera. So these settings don't actually work. So here we got depth of, view, uh, depth of field overlay colors. So I can choose an overlay color again. So maybe we'll go with blue. And the opacity, if I turn it up. So you can't really see anything there. If I go to my uh, camera view and I turn on my plane visibility. So if I turn off the, turn on the uh, near one, you'll see that it's blue. So what this is telling me is this one here. I'll go back to a perspective view. So the near depth of plane visibility is this one here, this box here. And then the far one is this one here. Now this is a great way to figure out um, what you know what depth of field you want. So actually, what I'll do is I'll turn on the far one because that'll make it better. So if I go to my camera, you see this blue bit here. So as soon as I start, go back to my camera and go back to my focal distance. Actually, what I'll do is I'll go to perspective. Go back to my focal distance and actually uh, bring it in. So if I bring it in a bit more, there we go. And then I go to my camera. So this is the actual far plane here. So you can see now I've got it uh, in between the two. So this is why this is uh, not blurry now. So I've got it in between the two and I can actually uh, turn it off. So let's go back to there. Actually, even decrease the opacity. There you go. That gives you a better idea of what exactly he's doing. There we go. So you can see, I see there his foot. His foot actually would be um, would have the DOF uh, effect, depth of field effect there. So I've actually turned this off now. It's pretty white. Turn the opacity off. Actually, there we go. So now you can see the depth of field is on there, and we've got our depth of field going. So that's what these settings are here. 
So the next setting we'll look at is the lens. So you photography buffs uh, will probably know more about the lens than I do. So if you're into your photography and cameras, you'll probably know a lot more. Now the lens thickness, I was unable to get working. However, I found a great resource if you want to look at it. So I'll put the uh, link in the description box below for that. And I'll just show you very briefly here. So IRA lens thickness, uh, thickness test. So someone has kindly done a uh, IRA thickness test to show you what exactly happens. And it appears as though the uh, focal length is increased with the lens thickness. Um, I haven't been able to get it working, so maybe you can have a look at that. What I'll do is the, the link for this will be in the description box. So make sure you check that out if you want to know more about lens thickness. And we'll go back to that studio. And over here we've got um, the lens radial bias. I will talk about that uh, in, a, in a brief moment. We'll go with the lens shift first. Okay, so I've just loaded another scene just to show you uh, what the actual lens shift does. So in lens, camera lens, got the camera here, lens shift. Uh, essentially what this does on the x-axis, it just moves the actual lens left or right. So five, a positive number will move to the left and a negative number will move it to the right. So minus five will move to the right. Now, it doesn't look like it does much, but if I show you in this PDF that I've created, you'll see that if you look at the edges here, these edges here, you'll see that the actual angle changes here. Okay, not a very good line, but you understand the point. So what it, what it is essentially is this is using, I've moved this using the uh, X translate uh, on the actual camera. And this is actually using this with the shift on moving it. So essentially what will happen is as you keep going to the left, which I'll do in here, I turn this off. Okay, as I keep going to the left, what will happen is this line here will is will will end up being straight. So it will end up converging like being straight, like there. This line here ends up being straight. Now, obviously with the lens shift, that would never happen because it would always keep it at, at an angle. Because obviously we've manipulated the camera and we moved the lens shift across. Now, I highly, highly, definitely highly recommend you read this here, this lens shift, which explains it way better than I could ever explain it. And it's got some really good videos, um, shows you exactly what shift lens does fantastic resource. So remember the links for that will be in the description, in the description box below. So if I go back to this, so with the actual Y, it will just move it up and down. So a positive number will move it down and then a negative number will move it up. So minus five, move it higher up. Now again, it looks like it doesn't do anything. It's just moved it up and down. We could probably do that with the, with the uh, Y translate, but let me show you exactly what happens there. So scroll down here. So if you have a look here, this is with the this was actually as it is, nothing done here, no nothing special with the camera, just a normal camera here. This is just a normal camera. If you have a look at the road here, and then have a look at the road here, you'll see with the lens shift Y on, it actually kind of again you've got this kind of diagonal thing going on here. But with this, with the Y shift, it's actually keeping it straight. Everything's straight. So this roll is actually straight like this. So again, I recommend check out that resource, which will explain it way better than I did. And you'll, you'll, you'll understand exactly what a lens shift is and exactly how it works. So if you go back here, and I'll just uh, go back to my lens here. Let's take that off. Okay, so we've got the lens stereo offset uh, option here. So if I change this to say something like two, if I move a mouse here, you'll see like a ghost image here. So what this is, is your is you can actually create uh, stereoscopic uh, images. Um, so you could actually create those really cool stereoscopic images, like 3D talent images using this effect. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about it because that would be another tutorial, but I've seen a lot of uh, people using uh, other methods to create this. So they don't really use this lens stereo offset method because there's a lot of issues involved with the actual, um, 
the actual perspective view and everything, this perspective and things kind of things kind of change basically when you use this. So you want to get the exact stereo, stereo, stereoscopic uh, view, but there's something you possibly could look into. So that's something you could possibly look into. Okay, so lens distortion types. So these are just different types of distortions you can do. So we've got uh, spherical distortion. So there's our spherical distortion here. We've got a cylindrical here. So there you go. That actually looks kind of cool. So next up, we got the uh, poly three option here. So with the poly three, you've got the lens distortion K1. So if I increase that, you'll see it starts bending. So maybe you can use that for a really cool effect for something. Maybe like I said, like a dreamlike uh, state or something. Um, the K2, if I turn this back to normal, the K2 and the K3 don't actually work uh, with the poly three. Okay, and the next one we got the inverse. So again, I can use K1. So basically just inverting it. So with the poly three, when I went to the right, it actually went in. And with the inverse, it will obviously do the opposite. So if I go in, it will actually go out. Uh, if I actually, sorry, incre increase the um, K1 distortion, it will actually go in. So it gives you kind of like that fishbowl kind of effect going there. And if we go to Poly5, now Poly5 is very interesting because Poly5 lets you use more than one. So we can use the uh, K1 to kind of zoom in, zoom out. There we go. Got like a fishbowl thing going. And we can actually use a K2 as well. So we can actually kind of, you know, really go a bit crazy. So there we got some kind of weird effect going on there. K3 doesn't actually work on this. So we can change that as much as we want. K3 doesn't work with the Poly5. So again, you've got the inverse Poly5. And that just does the opposite. Uh, next, we've got the, I can't even say that, Plittins, Plittins, I assume Plittins. So there we go. We've got our K1 there doing the old, there we've got K2, which is uh, disrupting it. And I think K3 works on this one. There we go. K3 works on this one as well. So there you go. And then you've got the inverse. So... There you can see the kind of like fishbowl effects if you want to do. Sometimes you see that photography. We can actually manipulate our camera to do those effects now. So now you know how to do that. Maybe you could do some kind of crazy fishbowl type effects if you want to do it. And then obviously you've got the lens distortion scale, which basically magnifies everything by a factor or whatever you choose. So if I did, uh, I don't know, two, there you go. It's magnified by a factor of two. And that actually looks very cool, doesn't it? Okay, so I'm going to just reset these back to normal because that was actually freaking me out a bit. <laughs> Let me just uh, reset all these. Put them back to none. And blades, I'll come back to blades in a bit because that's to do with all the bokeh effects, the bokeh effects, or however you say it. And then we've got dimensions. So what we can do, which is really cool, we can use, use local dimensions, is we can actually set specific dimensions for each camera. So instead of using the global settings here, which are in uh, general, so these are like the global settings, we can actually have separate settings for each camera. So we can have something different for each camera, which is kind of cool. So maybe you've got several cameras set up and you want to uh, have different um, uh, resolutions for those cameras. So you could have, say, I want to say I wanted four by three on camera three. I want 16 by nine by on camera two. And then on camera three, I want, um, I don't know, uh, whatever the new ratio is now, 16 by 10, is that the new ratio? Whatever the new ratio is. So you can do that, that's very cool. And then we've got the headlamp. Now the headlamp, piece of advice for headlamp, never ever use a headlamp. It's absolutely awful for lighting. It's only there because I don't even know why it's there. So definitely don't use a headlamp, but you could just choose you can obviously make it brighter if you wanted to. You can offset the you can offset the light so you can have the light coming from a different direction. But generally, we would not use all because uh, the headlamp is absolutely awful for lighting. So that should always be set to off, I think, because you've got many many other ways to light your scenes way better now that you know what to do, how to light your scenes. You've got so many great ways to light our scenes that the headlamp is basically worthless, in my opinion.
Right, so I've jumped back into my original scene and now I'm going to go for those of you who decide to stick with that kind of boring stuff with the lens, you've come to the good bit, which is the bokeh effects I'm going to go over now. So basically what I'm going to do is show you how to get those cool effects that you do. So this is the HDRI map I'm going to use for, for my bokeh effects. And what I'm going to do is just double check that the uh, field of view is set correctly. So perspective view. Just going to turn that around. So let's see. Okay, that's cool. That's set nicely. Go back to my camera. The lens radial bias basically makes this kind of blurry bit more more or less blurry. So if we make it uh, 0 0.3, there we go. See, so it's made it kind of more blurry here around the edges. It makes the edges more blurry. If I went a bit more crazy, I did actually 0 0.01. That's what that does. There you go. You get this kind of like cool effect here. Very cool effect. So when we go back to blades, so the aperture blades are the actual kind of the the uh, size, not the size, sorry, the shape of the actual blades. So at the moment, zero. Zero is the circle, no sides. So if I did three, these will start to look like triangles. So if I do three, three-sided shape. There you go. They start to look like triangles. You can kind of figure it out. So three, three sides say triangle. If I went to five, like a pentagon, they start to look like pentagons. There we go. Kind of like the pentagon effect. And you can go all the way up to 17 if you want to. I normally go up to about 15, 17. And the aperture blade rotation is actual degrees of rotation. So they choose something like, I don't know, 135, and they'll, they'll, they will rotate to 135 degrees. Now the lens, a radial bias is quite a bit uh, high there, so I'll turn it back to 0 0.3. And there's our cool effects. So it's very, very easy to do with a HDRI map. I think it looks way better with a HDRI map. They have cool lights on, so something like this. Um, oh, the HDRI map here that I've used is called Building Modern Building Nights. Uh, this is from um, HDRI uh, website. Uh, I'll put the link in the description box below as well. And if you want to know more about bulk effects, what I really want to do is this fantastic resource uh, that uh, Daz Studio, uh, a Deviant Art uh, user created. Uh, what's his name? Cha Cha. Uh, you know, thank you very much for this Cha Cha. Great resource. You can download this resource, and it literally goes into very great detail on how to do, create these cool effects like this. You can even use your own shapes and, it, and everything like that. So very, very cool things you can do. So I'll put the link for this in the description box below. Uh, make sure you download that and have a look at that if you want to know more about DOF and bokeh effects and cool stuff like that. Um, so this is a shout out to Chacha. He did a very, very cool job for that. So thank you very much for that, helping out the community. I love it. Okay, so we covered so much today in that video with the camera settings and how to create our own bokeh effects using that studio. I need to lie down, but before I do, make sure you check out these videos here, make sure to hit the subscribe button here, and make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you like the video, and leave a comment down below, and I'll see you in that next video!